Um, I'm Marianne Monaraj. I uh, am the author of A Feast of Serendib, which is a new Sri Lankan cookbook. I am not primarily a chef. I am a writer. Um, and what happened was a few years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and had a year of treatment and I'm fine now. But, um, but it, I sort of came out of that and started obsessively cooking uh, Sri Lankan food, um, sort of starting with the dishes my mom had taught me. We moved to the US in 1973 when I was two years old. Um, but then I, I got obsessive and I bought a whole bunch of cookbooks and went online and looked a lot of recipes and cooking videos and ended up writing a cookbook in part, I think, to pass along to my kids um, all of this food that at that point, especially this was a few years ago that I was putting the book together, they were still pretty young and they mostly didn't want to eat Sri Lankan food at all. They thought spicy food was terrifying and um, as much as I tried to tell them it wasn't spicy, it's, it's only been in the last few years that they've started venturing in uh, to <laughs> Sri Lankan food. So I was anxious about it. So I wrote this book and I had a lot of fun doing it, and I hope I can share some of this with you. So my plan is that we're gonna make three things. We're gonna make rice, we're gonna make uh, a potato and egg sodhi, um, which is like a, a very mild curry and with coconut milk, and then we're gonna make the kale sambal. And because the kale sambal itself takes like, I don't know, 10 minutes to make, so it would not really fill up a whole hour of cooking class. Um, and that will also put together a really nice vegetarian meal that you know, you'd be happy to have for dinner um, any night. I'm now carrying my laptop around, so this is kind of an interesting experience. But uh, over here, we have some basmati rice, actually, having just mentioned basmati rice. And um, I'm gonna make rice to start. And to do that, I'm gonna do a really made rice growing up for you know much of my life. A ratio of two to four, so two cups of rice, four cups of water, put in a pinch of salt, that will make it better. And then um, if you want, you can fancy it up. So any ideas what you would do to fancy it up? I'm sorry, I'm like totally in teacher mode. So what would you do to make your plain rice a little bit fancier as I get the water? Oh, add some cumin that you have uh, roasted on a dry pot and then add a little bit of oil and then add it to the cooked rice and stir it in. It tastes That's lovely. Very fancy, mm. though, but this always sounds way better. Sorry, what was, I missed that last thing. Oh, I said I was going to say dill, adding dill, but I, I think mimosa sounds way better. <laughs> No, dill rice is great. It's more of a Persian thing than a Sri Lankan thing, but it's definitely a great way to... Dill rice is delightful, and Amy has suggested in the chat that butter, of course, in South Asia, we use ghee um, and many parts of it, which is clarified butter, and that makes everything taste so much richer and delicious. Anytime my mom was cooking for a party, she would add butter to the rice, right, to make it a little bit nicer for everybody. Sometimes you could add saffron, um, which is beautiful and aromatic. That's very fancy. If you want a little bit of a cheat, sometimes people put in a little bit of turmeric, which is much cheaper than saffron, and that gives you the yellow color. Mm -hmm. Don't put in too much. Turmeric has a very strong flavor. It's not as, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you don't want like intensely turmeric -y rice, I think. Um, but a little bit, tiny bit, will uh, change the color of your rice. It'll be attractive and interesting. The, I have a question. Be careful with turmeric because it will stain your clothes. So, yes, and stain uh, everything around your refrigerator. I, I happen to be. Um, are you draining? Are you rinsing off your rice? So I did some prep beforehand because I realized that I would not have time otherwise uh, to get through things. Yes, I would recommend, you know, you don't have to. Um, if you're buying rice from, and I'm sorry, my stove clicks, and I have to like take a second to make it stop the clicky thing. Um, okay. If you're buying rice from the Indian store, right, um, there's a good chance that uh, it was not thoroughly washed beforehand. So my mom 
was always pretty rigorous about washing the rice. Um, you just, you don't want to make rice and end up with like a little bug in your rice. That's no fun. Right. Uh, you don't, there, there are like, there are certain techniques and procedures where you wash rice and it takes off a layer of um, rice stuff. I'm going to forget what it's called. The starch? Um, it, the starch, yes, which changes the consistency. You don't need to do it for that purpose to make Sri Lankan rice. Um, I also, I'm making white rice, basmati rice, which we eat all the time. Um, you could also make red rice or brown rice, but Sri Lankan red rice is, I think, really tasty. You, um, it, it, it's maybe a little bit hard to find. Um, I buy mine online from a, a website called Kapruka that does Sri Lankan import foods. Um, and if you're near, oh wait, you guys are in Skokie. You can go to Gita's, Gita's may have it. Um, and because they have some Sri Lankan food. I would call first and I think right now during pandemic times, you have to make an appointment um, to go into Gita and get food or so I was told I haven't been over there uh, in a little bit. So Gita's fine foods in Skokie. Um, there you go, there's a little ad for a local business. So, um, so I'm gonna add a couple other things to my rice that are just easy. So one of them is cashews, cashews. Um, and these are just straight out of the container. You can use salted if you don't mind adding a little bit more salt. Unsalted, roasted. Unroasted is fine. Really, it's kind of like whatever you like. What's great about adding cashews, and I'm just gonna put them in right at the beginning. And I put in maybe half a cup, uh, maybe a little bit more, I didn't really measure, is, but that adds protein, right? And so if you're making a vegetarian meal, sorry, if you're making a vegetarian meal, <laughs> Um, adding the cashews will uh, just really, you know, it makes it more of a full meal um, and they're delicious. Also, if you are having guests over, cashews are a little expensive. And so um, including cashews in the meal is a little bit of a sort of, here's this luxurious thing that I'm giving you, right? Um, if you wanted to make a fancy curry, a cashew curry is a very classic, like, I have vegetarians over and I want to show them how much I love them, so I will make them cashew curry. Um, so, cause it's like, I don't know, $16 for like a pound of cashews. So it's, um, they're pricey. Um, you can also, if like me, you have children who are sometimes resistant to eating vegetables, um, frozen peas. You can just dump in some frozen peas in the rice and that will bump up. Oh, Marianne, I have kiddos who do not eat peas. You are so lucky. <laughs> oh, no, the mine, thankfully, peas, peas, broccoli, and bell pepper are the ones that they will tolerate. Anand will eat corn. Kavia does not. I think that might be it right now. Edamame, they'll eat edamame. So, yeah, no, peas, frozen peas, in fact, like, these days they will tolerate eating some that are cooked, so I can do this. For a long time, they would only eat them frozen right out of, like, the freezer. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> it can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, if you're cooking for kids, the Sri Lankan vegetable dish that I've had the most success with is cauliflower curry. And I think it's because we fry the onions and the cauliflower so much that they, yeah, I don't know, fried food is just delicious, right? And so it's like caramelized and sweet and salty and doesn't taste like a vegetable anymore. And by the time you're done, it may not be that healthy, I don't know. but. Um, but it's good. Okay, so the rice is going. I'm gonna set a timer for 15 minutes because I am ADD and I forget things constantly and timers are my salvation in the kitchen. So. Okay, so that's one thing. As soon as that comes to a boil, I'm gonna put a lid on and turn it down to low and then just let it simmer. I realize I should pause and just talk a little bit about what Sri Lankan food is like. Because if you've had Indian food, you might think, okay, Sri Lankan is just like Indian. So first of all, I feel like I have to talk about Indian food in America because um, what you, if you walk into sort of a generic Indian restaurant in America, you're going to see probably chicken korma, chicken tikka masala, maybe sag paneer, rice, naan, like there's some sort of standbys, mango lassi, all of which are delicious and I like them. But um, it's, it's kind of astonishing how, you know, restaurant culture 
um, and specifically ethnic restaurant culture and like what you need to do to survive uh, in America back in the day, kind of reduced the menu down to like this little handful of things. And I admit, I find it comforting when I can walk into a restaurant and get something that is familiar. So I don't know, I was visiting Switzerland with my boyfriend at the time and um, after a week of eating Swiss food, there was one day where I just walked into Starbucks and I was like, I need something I recognize, <laughs> right? And I was very grateful to get that. So, so yes, like walking in and getting chicken tikka is great, but um, first of all, chicken tikka masala is, I believe, a British invention. Um, so not actually Indian food, <laughs> um, part of the rich colonial heritage um, of South Asia. And, and in general, I think what you will get in most Indian restaurants in America tends to be more from North India, um, which is really different uh, than South Indian food. As you head towards South India, you're gonna start seeing dishes like uh, thosa, upama. So if those sound familiar to you, you're heading into the South Indian arena. And if you then go a little further south, you get to Sri Lanka. And I would say like as a real shorthand, Sri Lankan food flavor wise and composition wise is kind of like a cross between South Indian and Thai food. So if you've had like a, a Thai coconut milk curry, that kind of approach to making a curry is not so dissimilar from what we would do in Sri Lanka. The use of coconut milk, the use of a lot of um, citrus, a lot of islandy flavors, you know, essentially, um, inflecting the sort of spice usage of South India. I don't know, I hope that's sort of vaguely helpful. You imagine crossing South India and Thai food and you kind of get Sri Lankan food. Um, there is some stuff that is very spicy and my personal theory, I have no evidence of this, is that it's just because the we're on the equator and so the chili peppers grow hotter, right? So um, they just get a lot of sun, I know here in Chicago, when I try and grow chili peppers, I am lucky if I get like, you know, at the very tail end of the summer, maybe a couple of my peppers have ripened enough to use, right? Um, we just don't have that long growing season. And I keep thinking I should start them early under grow lights and then maybe, maybe I'd be able to like really do a good job with it. So uh, in Sri Lanka, they just grow and grow and grow. They get very, very hot and people use what's around them. And so certainly if you go there, you're gonna get dishes. If you see anything that says deviled, that means it's spicy. <laughs> so deviled chicken, deviled beef, deviled potatoes, et cetera. That's the, the spicy. And if you love spicy, you can head in that direction. And if you don't, you can head far away. <laughs> there is plenty of things that don't have any spice at all. Um, and I have relatives who eat Sri Lankan food all the time, but don't like spicy food and they just don't put cayenne or green chilies in the food. So I feel like that's one of those misconceptions that I have to clear up all the time because they're- Sacrilege, I, 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 sacrilege, what? sacrilege, Marianne. How can they not eat spicy food? Well, no, they really don't though, right? <laughs> so I know, yeah. I love it. And in fact, they're like endorphins. So chili, cayenne, when you eat that, it sets off endorphins in your brain so that even though it's causing pain in your mouth, it's making your brain happy, and so you want more of it. Um, and so, and especially as long as you, you can even experiment with this at home. If you have a bite of something really hot, and then you wait and you walk away or whatever, you're gonna really feel the pain of it, right? But if you keep eating more bites of really hot stuff, you're kind of the, you keep sending the little pleasure drills to your brain, and so you don't notice the heat quite as much. The, the pain only sets in when you stop, <laughs> at which point, um, what would you do to um, mitigate the chili heat? Any any ideas? Milk. 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 Oh, good. Oh, you guys said you didn't. So, <laughs> you, you, I didn't get to do my like my trip question, right? Like people people tend to say water, and water is not that effective. I do actually drink a lot of water, and it, it's not it doesn't it's not that it doesn't work at all, but it kind of also spreads the fire because it's spreading the oils around in your mouth, right? Um, milk actually like has a chemical reaction where I believe it is base, basic. Um, actually, I'm gonna take all the chemistry out because I don't really know. But the milk does interact with the chilies in a way that really mutes it. The other thing that really helps I think is starches. So potatoes, bread, 
And in fact, if you make a dish that's too spicy and you're like, oh, this is, this is too spicy for me, um, you've got a curry going. I think the two ways to fix it are to A, add some potatoes, B, add some milk. So do both. So, all right. Um, questions? Okay. So next thing we're going to do is make some potato curry. So I did a little bit of chopping in advance, but just in case, I thought I would do some um, chopping of an onion. So this is a, this happens to be a red onion, but you could use a yellow onion. In Sri Lanka, they have these little red Bombay onions that are hard to find around here. But my mom always cooked with yellow onions and it works fine. Um, you cut off the top and the end. Sorry, I keep forgetting there are people who don't do any cooking. So you cut off the top and the end and then cut it in half lengthwise and then peel it. And you want to get all the brownish stuff off. Okay. Um, two. All right, this is super boring. And then what I will do next is slice it lengthwise and then... Okay, so, and this is where I feel like I'm, I'm not being very frugal with the onion because I want to work kind of quickly and be sure we get through this. And I can feel my mother scolding me for wasting onion. So sorry, Amma, um, but it's for the greater good. Okay, so, so I'm going to slice the onion lengthwise, kind of holding it together as I go. And so here's a question like, how thinly do you have to slice it? And... It depends a little bit on what your goal is. So we're gonna be building a sauce with this and this is gonna be, this will be true whatever cuisine you're cooking where you're starting with onions to build a sauce. So this would be true for Italian or Southern or you know, et cetera, right? Um, that if you cut the onions large, if you cut your aromatic, so onions, bell pepper sometimes is used, celery is used, garlic, ginger, the larger you cut the pieces, the longer it will take them to break down into a sauce, right? And um, they may even, if you cut them really big, they may stay fairly chunky. So if your goal is to have a fairly smooth sauce and you don't want to spend all day doing it, then taking a tiny bit of extra time and care now to cut the onions pretty fine will pay off. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, sorry, you can't see my face. I know it's a little weird, but you can see me slicing. You know, my daughter, I've been trying to teach her how to cook. She's 13 now, and she can make scrambled eggs, which are harder than you might think. She can make um, like French toast, bomba toast, she can make pancakes, she can make crepes, but she's very resistant to cutting onions. And we are having ongoing conversations because it's a real, it's a real limiting factor. If you aren't willing to cut onions and start messing with the aromatics, then um, there's just a, there's like a whole array of cooking that is closed off. So I hope that we can, we can head you in that direction. Um, I think she's very scared of the fumes and the oniony sound. And so, um, not sound, smell, et cetera. And um, so she, she doesn't want to attempt it. And so there are some things you can do if the onion cutting bothers you. So, and it depends a little, sorry, I'm going to turn this up a little bit. Hello again. Uh, it depends a lot on um, what onions uh, you have. It's, you know, sometimes you buy supermarket onions and you start cutting and tears are pouring down your face. They're so strong. And sometimes you start and it's fine. It's like totally nothing. So um, I find that very hard to predict. Uh, so it is very fumey. Um, a, my mom would say that's going to be a tasty curry because that's, you know, it's got a lot of onion juice. So that's good. Um, the, the pain is at least for a good cause. Um, there are some things you can do to uh, deal with it. You can put a slice of bread on your head. Um, we tested that recently in a cooking video and it really does seem to work. I guess it absorbs the fumes. I don't know. Um, you can wear goggles, like swim goggles and just protect your eyes. So um, I have a pediatrician friend, she and I were talking about this, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, and she said, oh, if you wear nose plugs, that's actually really helpful, like swim nose plugs, because the fumes are actually, they're going up your nose and then getting behind your eyes, or I don't know. So, um, so those are some possible things if chopping onions is very 
So I'm gonna just set this curry going. Um, I'm gonna carry it over here. Let's see if I can show you everything. Okay. So we have we have the onions chopped and waiting in there. Over here we have my spices. I go through a lot of spices, so I decant them into these big jars full of spices. Um, you don't need to have a really huge um, Cabinet. You need to have a few. And sorry, that was my. So that's my rice timer telling me that my rice is ready, except that it's not actually because somehow it didn't come to a boil. So now I've covered it. I'm gonna let it cook a little more. Hopefully we'll have rice. Um, but you guys don't have to eat, so it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so. Lost track of what I was doing. Okay. I'm sorry, my stove is challenging. But, um, okay, so the base things you need are cumin seed and black mustard seed. If you can't get black mustard seed easily, brown mustard seed is fine. Um, if you, I, I would recommend not using yellow mustard seed because it has a really different flavor. So, um, and you just want a little bit of each, and you're going to put that in with some oil or butter or ghee. As you can see, I have a huge thing of Crisco canola oil um, because I go through it. So, and the, I'm not going through the like precise amounts here. They're all both in the cookbook, but also um, on my blog. There are lots there of them. And of course, the library would be happy to get you the cookbook. Um, so, okay. So that's coming up to temperature. And then I'm gonna to add to it some of the mustard seed and some cumin seed. Okay. And that's really the base for a curry, a Sri Lankan curry. When I first started cooking, for many years, that was most of what I did. I would do onions in oil, add black mustard seed, cumin seed, and then um, I like it spicy, so you bring that up to on high, you stir it. Um, if you need to walk away for a while, you might turn it down to medium or medium high. And okay, there we go. Um, and so, and then once the onions have softened and they'll go sort of golden translucent, that's when you are ready to start adding in other things. So that's where I'd put in cayenne pepper, some you know one to two teaspoons, depending on how hot you like it. Um, Sri Lankan curry powder, which if you if you can get it, but for many years I couldn't get it because um, it was I was living in Salt Lake City and places where it was very hard to find. I didn't know about the online, thing. and you you really can still make the curries even without that. It's just for our curry pepper, what we do typically is we take the spices and we roast them all in a dry pan. So coriander, cumin seed, fennel seed, fenugreek seed, which is methi seed. Um, sometimes you'll find it as methi. Cinnamon and cloves and cardamom seeds, those you don't have to roast. And then you grind them all together and it makes a curry powder. So, um, yeah, I think. Not sure. I may not. I may not even have any um, made up right now. But it's and then if you buy it in Sri Lanka, often that will have some cayenne mixed in. So it'll be a reddish color. That's from the cayenne. If you make it at home, you can control how much heat it has, and so you could put no cayenne in. Um, and that's that. I would say is like it adds a lot to any meat dishes, chicken, fish. Um, if you were going to make an eggplant curry, vegetarian um, jackfruit curry is a, is a very substantial curry uh, made with green jackfruit, which you can buy here in a can. Um, mushroom curry, all of those we would typically you'd use the Sri Lankan curry. So, um, so that's, that's my recommendation if you want to make something really, really Sri Lankan. -ish. Okay, oh, I wish you could smell this, but the onions are going. They smell great. Um, and I, because I'm going to go do something else, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it on medium. I think I can, after you've been cooking for a while, you can sort of listen and you can, you can hear when the onions are starting to burn. So, um, so 
So I will try and keep an ear out for that. Um, that, that process of simplifying is, I think, typical everywhere, right? So like, if you go and you get American food in Sri Lanka, <laughs> you're going to get a very, very generic version of American food, right? Like it will be, you can get the same burger in every hotel across Sri Lanka, right? So um, <laughs> they would have no idea how to do many variations. So I mean, so I don't mean to be dismissive of that, um, but just if you, if you go, then what you will find is that, of course, you know, Bengali food is different from Rajasthani food, is different from, you know, Pakistani food, et cetera. Like all, all of the areas are different. And then, of course, within the areas, there's a ton of difference too. Like every one of my aunties does her curry powder blend a little differently, right? Um, and so we can all make chicken curry, but they're all slightly different just the way that, you know, I don't know, in America, we argue about what goes in chili, right? So like, should there be beans? Should there not be beans? Should there be meat? Should there not be meat, et cetera? So, um, so similarly. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go on with the kale. I have 15 minutes left. Can I do it in 15 minutes? I think I can. Um, so here's some kale. So I washed it in advance and I let it dry. That's really important if you're going to use, if you're going to cheat and use the food processor. Because um, if you put wet kale into the food processor and try and grind it, it will uh, mush up and it'll, it'll like break down, it'll even blacken a little bit. So you want to avoid that. It's not as much, not as important if you're going to do it by hand. So here's the kale. It has like this big rib down the middle, right? You don't want to try to eat that. So the first thing I would do if I were making this um, by hand is I would just pull all the kale leaves off the rib like that, right? So this doesn't take very long. You don't have to be very neat because it's all going to get chopped up, okay? So you do that, you're left with this. This can be composted. Um, you do that with all of it. Um, then we're going to chop it up really fine and I, I find that it helps to chop, if you're gonna chop leaves really fine, I actually find it makes it a little easier if you do a French thing called chiffonading. So to do that, you layer them. So I'm making like a little stack of leaves, right? And then, and I would kind of, I'd probably do this for each like big leaf of romaine, of kale, sorry. Um, okay, so now I've got a stack of leaves and then like if you were going to make a basil chiffonade, you'd layer the basil and you'd roll it up really tightly into a little, little tight roll. You can't roll it up that tightly, but roll it up as best you can. So there was my little roll. And then that gives you a lot of like fine control. And you can do the chiffonade is when you slice this tightly rolled thing of leaves very thinly. Okay. And I don't know if you can, I hope you can see the texture of this, but this is really pretty fine. Now they're in strips and we actually want them more chopped. So I'm going to do a cross cut after I finish this. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. So I'm going to turn it and trying to, if you can keep them sort of together, then it'll, you know, it'll be, it's, it's just easier if you keep control of it um, rather than having them fly all over the place, I find. So at that point, I hope you can see, it's a really fine chop of kale. You want it pretty fine um, because what's going to happen with the kale salad, it's really interesting, the symbol, is that um, because, like, I do not love kale normally. <laughs> so I can eat some kale chips. They're okay. Um, I love this dish. And I don't love kale normally because it can be a little tough and a little aggressively kale -y. Um, and as opposed to, you know, some of the milder lettuces and, but by chopping it up really fine, and then we're going to marinate it with, um, some other ingredients, the lime juice in particular, um, breaks it down so that the end result here, and I hope you all go home and go off and try this, um, it's not going to taste like any kale you've ever had. So, uh, and it's, it's a really great accompaniment to any curry. Okay. So, 
you could, that didn't take very long. I could do that with the rest of this. Or I could cheat and use the food processor. Now, again, Amma, Amma would, um, would scold me a little bit for this because she would say, it grinds it up too finely, et cetera. So, and she also doesn't like it when I use the food processor for onions. So if you are trying to impress my mother, do it by hand. But um, otherwise, otherwise, you can just buy chopped kale, already washed, ready to eat. So all you wanna do is chop it up more finely. So I would put it in the food processor. You do have to do this in batches because if you try and like fit it all in there at once, it will just mush, right? It'll squish up, it won't grind reasonably. So it's, to get through a bag of that, it's about four batches and then, Use the pulse um, until it's pretty fine. Maybe one more. Okay. So, so there is some beautiful bright green kale. And so I'm gonna just I'm just gonna dump them all in together. So I have some I did some in advance. So there's some kale. There's some more kale. Don't cut yourself on the food processor blade. All right. I'm going to add in the kale that I chopped by hand, which is not quite as bright green, but still good. Okay. And then now we just mix some stuff in. We're going to chop, um, chop one onion, which I did in advance. So I'm putting that in. And then we're going to add lime juice, cherry tomatoes, salt, sugar, um, Green chilies if you want, but I actually mostly don't for this. Um, and fresh coconut would be ideal. I rarely have fresh coconut around. So um, there are a couple of tricks you can use for that. So we'll get to that in a minute. Any questions before we keep going? No, you guys are great. Okay, um, let's go check on our onions. All right, so over here, you can see that the onions have been, can you see? Hard. I will make you see. Okay, there you go. So you can see that the onions are sauteing and hopefully, and they, they might have a tiny bit of color on them because you wandered away. And if you were very, very finicky, you might say, well, it's not really supposed to have any color on it. You should stand over it and stir it the entire time. And I would say, who has time for that? Um, if you wanted at this point, so you could have added to your onions, you could, sorry, if you could have added to your onions, ginger and garlic, um, and not a requirement, but generally will make curries better. So the big exception to that is if you're doing Jane cooking, um, Jane cuisine, um, their religious practices uh, don't allow aromatics. And so they're not allowed to use onions, ginger, or garlic. Um, which is challenging. And I don't have any Jane friends, but I do have one friend who is allergic to all of those things. So I have used Jane recipes to cook curries for him. And I'm not Jane, but I do have a partner who grew up in the Jane tradition and they often use asafetidida as a yeah. substitute for um, onions and garlic. Yeah, so that was, that was what I ended up, so asafetidida, as, I don't know how to pronounce it. I, I always said asafetida, but Asafetidida is uh, is uh, it has a very strong and interesting flavor. You'll sometimes see it called hing, I think, and uh, it definitely helps with adding flavor. Um, oh, I'm getting a survey from the library about how many participants in my household have participated in this event. I will say one. Okay, so <laughs> um, so but yes, yeah, so add ginger and garlic if you feel like peeling some ginger and garlic. You can also, um, I have a big jar of chopped ginger and garlic that I bought in the Indian section of my local grocery store. My Sri Lankan friend who is a more finicky cook than me scolds me for using it because she says it doesn't taste fresh. So your call, but there are days when I do not want to stand here peeling garlic and I just want a little bit of extra flavor. So I do use that sometimes. Um, Oh, I forgot to say one thing about chopping onions. If you really don't want to chop onions, 
um, you can buy frozen chopped onions and um, just use those. Here in, I live in Oak Park, so Pete's carries them. And I use them primarily when I'm cooking for a big party. And I would otherwise be chopping three onions for each curry and I'm making 20 curries. And that is really a ridiculous amount of onions. So um, the only thing is if you use the frozen chopped onions, as they cook, they give off a lot of water. So you're adding a lot more moisture to the dish. So you just have to cook it off longer is in my experience. So um, to get it down to what they're supposed to be like. Okay, and then going back to the ginger and garlic, I'll say if you're, I'm not putting ginger in to this mostly because um, they were out of fresh ginger at the grocery store when I went, sort of unusual pandemic um, shortages. Uh, but uh, ginger, you can add with the onions and just cook it all at the same time. Garlic, I would wait and add it a little bit further in because garlic burns easily. And so you don't want to put it in at the beginning when your onions are on higher heat, only after you've turned them down. So tossing some chopped garlic in, and then the curry I'm making is, it's called sodi kirehori. It is a, a very standard sort of yellow curry that you would have with string hoppers as a Sri Lankan food or um, just with rice. Um, do you, Mimosa, do you guys have kirihodi? Do you, or sabi, anything like that? Like a yellow curry with potato and hard boiled egg? Not quite, but there's variations of that. I mean, potatoes are um, a staple in many different parts of India yeah. and so, um, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And I also think that, um, you know, in, in certain parts of the, of the subcontinent, eggs are not considered vegetarian, so there's restrictions, but many places they do do an egg curry and a variation of it. So, and of course, like potatoes are not native to the region, <laughs> and so, but we have adopted them very strongly and uh, use them all the time. So, um, the potato is a very useful vegetable, starch tuber, the very useful tuber. So um, I'm going to do, I'm peeling two of them that I'll throw in and then, um, and then I actually hard boil the eggs in advance. If I weren't trying to like teach this at the same time, I would say that this whole meal is about an, maybe 45 minutes to an hour once you know what you're doing. Um, what I would do is I would start the eggs first, start them boiling. When they come to a boil, I would, um, cover them, set a timer for 15 minutes, leave them, and then they'll be done, run some cold water over them and peel them when you have a free moment. Um, then you set the rice going. Um, then you make the curry. The curry will take somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes to cook. So this is not gonna be done before the end of our, our uh, class today. Um, and then you make the kale sambal is basically ready as soon as you finish assembling it. So. Um, if you want your curry to cook faster, cut the potatoes smaller, right? So um, if you have like big potato chunks, they're going to take a lot longer to cook. Uh, you can also, my mom, to hurry up a curry sometimes, she would par cook the tomato, sorry, the potatoes in the microwave in boiling water. So if you ever need to like speed up your potato cooking dish, you like put them in a glass bowl, cover them with water, stick them in the microwave, set it going for, mm, I don't know. You gotta bring it to a boil at least. Um, so maybe like three to five minutes. And then, sorry, and what I'm doing here is just chopping potatoes. So I peel them, I slice them in half, turn them over, slice them in half again. And now I'm just cutting them into this size pieces. You could cut them bigger. That's totally up to you. Um, but yeah, if you par cook them in the microwave, you can get them sort of like in five minutes, you can get them halfway cooked. So that'll probably shave five, 10 minutes off your overall cooking process. Okay, so at this point, the onions are ready. I'm gonna go ahead, I can't do this all at once. I'm gonna go ahead and dump this in um, with the onions and the garlic and the black mustard seed and the cumin seed. Don't forget to put in a teaspoon of salt or you will be sad. 
Um, and then um, you would need to stand there and stir it because otherwise it would burn, at least periodically. But we're actually going to add coconut milk. And so the coconut milk, it'll then cook in the coconut milk and that'll keep it from burning. I like this brand. They really should pay me because I say this a lot. Chowko, um, which here they carry it at Pete's in Oak Park. Um, Asian markets will, I think, basically always have this brand. It tastes more coconutty to me than most of the others, any of the others I've tried. Um, and I would specifically, I would warn you off trying to do light coconut milk. I have tried uh, in the interest of, you know, possibly losing some weight or whatever. And you just lose so much flavor, it's not worth it. It makes you sad. Um, it would be better to use regular coconut milk and just use less of it or eat less um, than, than have this kind of like watered down version. Okay, so I'm gonna dump the whole thing in. Ah. You could put in like half a thing of coconut milk and a cup of water instead if you wanted. Okay. And this is now, it's almost done. I'm gonna add just so, oh, there you go. It's sort of simmering in there. It's gonna have to cook for a while to come to temperature. And I'm gonna add one more seasoning, which is just a little turmeric. Um, you could add um, fenugreek is a really common thing to add to this dish, um, which is another seed. And if you know any um, nursing mothers, this is um, this kind of uh, white yellow milk curry it, with loaded with fenugreek is traditional for um, new moms because fenugreek is a galactagogue. It, it really enhances milk production. So, um, oh, and I almost forgot. There's one more thing I do need to add to this, which is curry leaves. So these are curry leaves. I used to have to grow my own tree of them, and um, which was hard to do. Um, but now, as of like last year, they're at Whole Foods, they're at Pete's, they're all over the place. Um, they grow, get them from Mexico, and so I'm gonna put about a dozen in. That is a really characteristic Sri Lankan, South Indian herb that um, just, I don't know, like, it, it, it makes it taste much more Sri Lankan. It's hard to say, and it adds a great aromatic element, but also a great flavor. And so we put it in, in basically all of our curries. You're gonna throw in a stalk of curry leaves if you can. If you can't, again, it's fine. I didn't have it for a long time. So, okay, so that's now what this dish oh, looks like at this point. And then here are my hard boiled eggs. Not very exciting to look at, but you would shell them and you'd slip them in. And you'd shell them, cut them in half, slip them in, and then taste it. And so there's this um, phrase, upupuli, which my mother would always say, which was, which is, uh, upu is salt and puli is tang, right? So at the end of every dish, you taste it and then adjust the seasonings to how much salt, how much lime juice, um, you're putting in. They didn't, they didn't have lemons in Sri Lanka back in the day, although my mom raising me in Connecticut couldn't get limes for a long time and so she used lemons, but um, it would have been limes and so you can use lime juice from a bottle. So, um, but you just, I would just squeeze some in at the end. So like taste it and say, do I want it a little more tangy? Um, let's add some lime juice and usually Sri Lankan curry is sort of balance, salt, spicy, um, sweet, and tangy, like those four elements, right, is what you would do in a curry. And now, can I, can I keep them for a couple more minutes? Mimosa, Lena, that's okay? I know we're like at time, so you guys are all right, right? Okay, let me, let me keep you for two more minutes. I'll just tell you what the last things that we're doing here. So here's the kale salad, right? We've got the kale, we've got the onions, tomatoes, you can use one tomato and chop it up. What I will often do is use a mix of cherry tomatoes because they're just really pretty. So orange and red tomatoes. 
So, all right. And then I'm really just chopping them and putting them in. Um, about a cup of cherry tomatoes for a whole bag of kale. And we did one onion. So, okay. And then coconut, the, I wanted to be sure to tell you about the coconut because what you can usually find is desiccated coconut, dried coconut. Don't buy the sweetened coconut, which you can get in the baking aisle. That's only for desserts, right? Um, and similarly, when you're going to buy coconut milk, don't buy the sweetened coconut milk. That's for making like tropical cocktails, right? It has a ton of extra sugar in it. It's gonna totally mess up the flavor of what you're doing. So, um, so now I've got some tomatoes in there. That's looking nice. So I'm gonna take my coconut. If you can find frozen coconut, that's terrific. Go ahead and use that um, because that still is very juicy. This can be either flaky or sometimes it's powdered and you want about a cup of it and it's pretty dry. So what I would do is I would add maybe two tablespoons of milk and microwave it for a minute or so and that rehydrates the coconut and brings it back to lovely juicy squeeziness, right? Um, if you don't want to use cow's milk, you could use coconut milk for that step, right, and keep it vegetarian, right? Um, and then it really is just, you, I'm so I feel bad about keeping you guys over, but you would um, just go ahead and add this to the kale sambal, add some salt, about a teaspoon of salt, add some sugar, like maybe a tablespoon or two of sugar, um, and you gotta mix it with your hands as the last step. You have to, you can try to do it with a fork, it just doesn't blend as well. Um, so wash your hands and then go to town. If, it helps if you have a big bowl, so you're not gonna spill all over the place and mix it up really well. And then if you can, leave it to sit in the fridge for like, I don't know, it doesn't have to be in the fridge, but like leave it to sit for at least 15 minutes. If you're gonna leave it longer than that, put it in the fridge um, and it'll blend and meld a little bit. Um, a sambal is, so we're making kale sambal. A sambal is essentially a salad. It's raw, right? It's, um, but it's really good for you. It doesn't have any oil aside from the fat that is inherent in the coconut, right? Um, and it's a great accompaniment to rice and curry. It's a fresh element on the plate. Um, if you, um, and if you have some leftover, what would traditionally happen is, you know, it's not fresh. It actually holds really, the kale holds really well in the fridge. So, um, you know, you make a salad like the second day, it's soggy and you don't want to eat it anymore. I find that the kale, um, oh, and I know if I said lime juice is the last ingredient, sorry, but um, that the kale stays crispy and good for, I don't know, like three or four days. It stays for a really long time. And it, all it'll do is it'll start to get a little dry. If that happens, I just add some more lime juice and mix it up again and then it's good. So, um, so I don't know. Any questions? Our curry is simmering. Our rice is, yeah, our rice is done. Yay. So there's rice, oh, which you would then like mix up so that all of the cashews and the peas are all mixed in beautifully. And then um, you'd serve it with in Sri Lanka, you'd have a big mound of rice on your plate in America, and then everything goes in like little things around it. Um, in America, we tend to, <laughs> to serve it differently, right? With, with a much smaller portion of rice. 